the international relations of East Asia. Here you can see students in China demonstrating during the conference in Paris that concluded the First World War. And they were demonstrating the lack of reforms on the principle of self-determination of foreign policies of the European powers. They'd expected that Wilson's 14 points would be equally applied to China, which they weren't. Structural theories of international relations in East Asia. Number one, there's little evidence of rigorous balancing by China against the US in East Asia and little evidence of rigorous balancing by smaller East Asian states against China. Balance of power theory may not explain outcomes as accurately in Asia as they do in Europe. Now, this could be because of China's historically benign hegemony in the past. For hundreds of years, China did not try to conquer its neighbors. It is unclear how China's power will be affected by environmental change. So many of the states don't immediately see China as uh, an automatically um, a large emerging threat. It is possible we are observing the preliminary stages of balancing in the form of soft balancing. So China is maneuvering itself slowly, but is not involved in an arms race. It's allowing its economy to take the lead. And once China's economy is bigger than that of the United States, then China will organize economic allies and then it'll challenge the United States. Power transition wars, consequently, may not be as likely as elsewhere. The surpassing of the US economy and power by China may not result in war. This is because China's regime stability depends on open trade, which would be blocked by a war. There was no war between China when its national wealth surpassed that of Japan, although it's not likely because Japan was an ally of the US, but at least there were no uh, uh, disputes that emerged between China and Japan at the time. Number three, in East Asia, it is common to make a civilizational distinction between East versus West, which if taken seriously, may take on a reality of its own. There are three state behaviors that supplement the normal practices that we associate with alliance behavior and realism. Number one, engagement. This is diplomatic interaction in order to alter a state's preferences. It's very often called constructive engagement, where two states interact on a policy, uh, where one state wants to influence the other. Number two, hedging. Investing in both deterrence and assurance typical of dealing with low threats. So you not only threaten a state, you also provide it promises. If you do this, we will do this. So it's a positive as well as a negative incentive procedure. Number three, insurance. Making low level alliance associations in the event of threat emergence. The US is deployed in Southern Korea. The US is deployed in Japan and Australia. The US does not yet have a military presence in Taiwan, nor does it have military arrangements with Vietnam. But it has been, uh, uh, in, has had exercises and military discussions with Vietnam. Hierarchy versus anarchy. In East Asia, particularly uh, in the sphere of influence of China, you had a tribute system. This was a formal exchange process whereby local powers sent delegations to the Chinese capital in exchange for diplomatic recognition and political endorsement. China's traditional Confucian tribute system was more peaceful than the European Westphalian system, with China receiving status as the hegemon and giving in exchange status to local uh, rulers. Now, Tianxia is the ordering principle of all under heaven, which is proposed as a Confucian hierarchy by East Asian scholars. Although it doesn't seem that much different than a general conception of hegemony. 
Number two, the Mandala system. In Southeast Asia, you had a great many islands that were significantly distant from each other over water barriers. And so this led to a loose hierarchical system built around a political center. And this often involved trade rather than military enforcement. There's also an important patron-client relationship feature in East Asian politics. In East Asian context, because of the traditional tremendous power of China relative to other states, smaller states tended to be compliant in exchange for domestic autonomy. One of the big issues was Vietnam going to China to confirm the change of government when there was a new, for example, a new uh, heir that took over. Originally, uh, China asked that Nam Viet change its name to Vietnam because a significant number of Vietnamese people, the Kejia people or the Hakka, live within China, which is where the Vietnamese originally migrated from. And China wanted Vietnam to be a country uh, rather than the southern version of a people who lived within China and therefore might want to secede and join Vietnam. And Vietnam uh, complied because it was the smaller power. International institutions in East Asia. East Asian institutions tend to be endogenous, dependent on the distribution of the power of its members, with small secretariats and little independence. In comparison with North Atlantic institutions that tend to be exogenous, where institutions are independent actors. East Asian institutions also lack enforcement mechanisms. For example, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, are less institutionalized than either the European Union or NATO. East Asian institutions are for the most part focused on dealing with internal threats, whereas North Atlantic institutions like the European Union and NATO were focused outwards as a reaction to the threat of communism during the Cold War. So North Atlantic institutions are stricter with regard to domestic governance, requiring democracy and resolution of irredentism with neighbors as a condition of membership. East Asian institutions tend to provide greater non-interference promises in domestic affairs. Defense alliances. During the Cold War, the U.S. led a multilateral alliance in the North Atlantic. But the U.S.'s security in East Asia was through bilateral ties, such as with Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and ANZUS, which is Australia and New Zealand. This is so for three reasons. One. East Asian states, unlike the status quo states of Europe, were revisionist and thus would be less easily managed by the U.S. through a multilateral institution. You can see in the top right the Takashima Island, which is a point of dispute between Japan and Korea. Korea currently maintains a defense company at that island. The main threat is entrapment, where an organization's members will detach from an organization if it is likely they'll be dragged into a conflict that is not in their interest. South Korea has made it very clear that they would not support the U.S. in a war with China over Taiwan. Number two, the U.S. did not see East Asian states as competent defense alliance partners in the way that it saw the leading members of NATO. With the exception of Japan, all of the other U.S. allies were less experienced at warfare than, say, England or France or Germany. Number three, East Asian states abided by the norm of avoiding great power conflict, and so avoided joining multilateral defense alliances directed against a major power. Neither Japan or South Korea wanted to be a part of a large alliance targeting specifically the communist states. ASEAN, for example, was founded to deal with the communist threat in Southeast Asia, but eventually evolved to including Vietnam as one of their members. A very important factor in East Asian 
international relations is historical memory. The events in East Asia following the Meiji Restoration in Japan in the 1860s involved Japanese invasions of much of East and Southeast Asia, with the most dramatic memories of occupation in Korea and China. These memories have a significant constraining effect on foreign policy and interstate cooperation. Memories of European colonialism in India and China has affected to make for more aggressive foreign policy in three ways. One, there are significant narratives of victimhood that are easily politically mobilized. Two, there is a sensitivity to challenges of domestic sovereignty. And contrasting Indian and Chinese sensitivity to territorial sovereignty can be observed in the 1962 Sino-Indian conflict. Number three, sensitivity to territorial concessions. You can see uh, in the center, of course, uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru of India. You can, on the extreme right, see uh, what is, is essentially a memorial of conflict in Japan, but it actually is built on top of a large burial of thousands of Korean years. Because the Japanese during the 16th century Hideyoshi invasion of Korea would chop the ears off of the Koreans they'd killed to keep track of the number of dead. And these were brought back to Japan. Attempts by the Korean government uh, to ask the US on their behalf to uh, return those uh, South Korean body parts have so far not succeeded. And so this indicates uh, a very profound discord between countries in East Asia, uh, even among close U.S. allies. Memories affect the popularity even of leaders of authoritarian states who can be more dismissive of audience costs. And this is so for three reasons. One, during the selection of a new leader, competition between candidates increases their sensitivity to popular opinion. In China, this could mean nationalism. Number two, non-democratic leaders that are sensitive to their legitimacy will rely on popular opinion. Number three, leaders may make use of memory or may create memory to justify foreign policy. Now, one of the implications of this is for the democratic peace, which is that lasting memories may inhibit the pacifying effect of a democratic dyad of two states that are democratic. Uh, 